praise in this house. I wonder how many of us believe in God for a promise. How many of you believe in God for a promise? Healing, strength, whatever it may be. Come on, lift your hand way up high. I'm believing God for whatever it may be. You're believing God. We're going to sing that, Rachel, your, your part there. I want us to sing that. But I want us to believe it. I said God said it, and I believe it. God said it, it's done. You're, you're believing for a miracle. Do, do this with me, just do this. Just shake the doubt off. Just sh shake the doubt off. Now, now we're going to believe God. Listen, when they sing this, I want you to sing that with them. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to sing something way down deep in your spirit this morning. We're going to believe today what God has said. And it's going to be done. Let's sing that. Come on, can we give God praise in the house? Come on, if you believe that it's done, let's give God praise in the house. What an awesome and a mighty God we serve. I want you to look at two or three people. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at them and say this, it's done. Just look at them and tell them, it's done. You don't have to tell them what it is, just tell them, it's done. It's done. Come on, it's done. It's done. Praise God. It is done. It's done. Come on, say that with me. It is done. How do we know that it's done? Because he said it. He said it and we believe it. Then it is done. Would you join hands with somebody there? Let's pray together. Father, God, you said it. We believe it. God, we call it done. God, I just pray that today, God, that something settles down deep in our spirit today, Lord. God, not just another song that we sung, but God, I pray that we would lay hold of the promises that you've given to us. And God, that we would say, because you said it, God, it's done. God, we're believing it's done, Lord. God, I believe healing is flowing throughout this house, God. God, we're believing, God, that not only in this house, but God, those that weren't able to be here that need your healing touch, God, they're going to experience that healing touch of God. So, God, we call it done. God, we call the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter. God, we call it done. They're coming home. God, that one that is lukewarm, we call it done. God, they're going to heat up. They're going to be an on-fire child of God. God, we just call it done today, Lord. God, the storms that we go through, 
God, that seems like they toss us here and there. God, we call it done. We're going to be like that tree that's planted by the waters. God, we're not going to sway. We're not going to be pushed. We're going to stand strong, Lord, because you said it. God, we call it done. We call it done. In Jesus' name, we call it done. And everybody said amen. Now, let's give him a crazy praise in the house. Come on. Give him a crazy praise in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. A mighty rushing wind, and it's close now.
sometimes if we haven't become dull in our hearing any moment one heartbeat away one breath away can I tell you could happen on a Sunday morning right in the middle of service the father could look over to the son and say today today's your wedding day and and the Bible said he's going to shout. He's going to shout real loud. My God. He's going to shout so loud, dead people are going to come up out of their graves. Oh, what a shout. He's going to shout enough for dead people to wake up. Then you and I, who are alive and remain, we're going to be changed in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. Then we're going to go be with him. I, I don't have all the details of how that's all going to transpire. I just have what he said. In a moment and in a twinkling of an eye. He said, somebody told me that it's like 156th of a second. Less than a second is a twinkling of an eye. We're going to be changed. Pastor Paul, we can be here like this one moment and in less than a second. We'll be completely changed. <laughs> We wouldn't have this mortal body anymore, this flesh that we're fighting again. In a twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed. We'll be changed and then we'd start gravitating. Mark, I've heard it all my life that, that, that when the rapture takes place and we get changed, it's like a rocket ship. We're just going to zoom out of here. I don't believe that. I really don't. I, I believe Jesus, he was the first fruits of the resurrection. He was our example. And I read in the Bible that when he ascended, they watched him. It wasn't like a rocket ship. They just watched him. A sin. I, I really believe that when you and I changed, I believe our ascension, I believe lost people are going to look and go, I missed it. I, 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 mi I wish I would have listened to what the old preachers said. I wish I would have believed what this old black book said. I, I wish I wouldn't have been so stubborn and had to have everything my way. I wish I didn't have so many things out there that kept me from living for God. I wish 
in a moment and in a twinkling of an eye, everything will change. But can I tell you, eternity will last forever. And right now is a very pivotal time. Because you've made a choice. You've either made a choice that heaven's going to be your home, or you've made a choice to reject God. You've made that choice. People, I hear this. People say, well, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? He doesn't send one person to hell. Never has, never will. He's a loving God. You choose to go there. You say, no, I don't choose. If you reject him, that's the choice that you're picking up to go. What a horrible, horrible time to know what you know, for people who be in church, to know what they know, to have heard what they've heard, and never make a change. What, what a horrible eternity that's going to be. And yet my Bible says that hell hath enlarged herself. Yet my Bible also said this, that it's not God's will that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He doesn't want one person to end up in eternity in hell. He does not want that. That's not his wish. That's not his desire. But can I tell you, you can only shake your fist in the face of God so many times. He'll let you have your way. And sometimes your way is not what you want. If you will, I want you to grab your Bibles, turn me to the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. The book of 2 Kings chapter 7. I want to talk to you a little bit different than maybe the normal sermon that I would do, but I want to talk to you today on this subject. Don't just sit there, do something. Say that with me. Don't just sit there, do something. Now, would you look at your neighbors and tell them, don't just sit there, do something. I think that we in the church have got so used to sitting that we have forgot that God has called us to do something. We, we, God did not save us to put us on a shelf like a trinket. And somehow or another, this mentality has spread throughout the church that when we get saved, we don't have to do nothing. We just sit down and, and wait for the coming of the Lord. When he said to occupy till I come, what he was saying was, get busy. Don't just sit there. Do something for me. And yet somehow or another in the Christian world, we have just kind of saw that we are just to sit down and wait for the Lord to come and not do anything. Listen, if we didn't have a job, he would have, he would have been, I think, more just if he would have killed us at salvation. Took us home. But because we have a job to do, because we have a purpose, we have an intention, we have a light to shine, we have a testimony to share, we have a story to tell, I, I believe he's left us here that we begin to share the story and tell our testimony. And, but somehow or another, the mentality, especially in the Western world, has fallen heavy that we just kindly sit and do nothing and wait for the preacher to do it or wait for somebody else to do it because that's not my job, that's somebody else's job. No, it's your job. It's your job. So, so, so I, I, I just want to get this in our spirit because I, I believe, listen, I, I, no dates, no time, I just believe that we are in the last moments of the last day on planet earth. I, I do. I, I just believe that. And, and I, I know the enemy has worked so hard and so meticulous at, at getting us to be numb to the effect. B because you some, remember, I think it was 1987, uh, there was a guy from Arkansas wrote a book, 87 Reasons Why the Lord Was Coming Back in 87. And then if you'll remember, he wrote another book in 1988, one year later. And this is what he said. This is no joke. This is what he said. Oops, I forgot one. So it was 88 reasons why he was coming back in 88. Well, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not the smartest guy in the, you know, but I think he, there was more than one he missed. Just saying. I, but, but he said no man knows the day or the hour. No man. 
That was a man that wrote the book. And here's the sad part. And this is, this is what I, I, I've been talking to, with you some on, on Wednesday night. The illiteracy in the church. 88 Reasons and 87 Reasons was a book that the church was using to teach. <laughs> no man will know the day or the hour. Jesus said, I don't even know the day and the hour. Only the Father knows that day and that hour. Only the Father. So listen, when somebody starts trying to set dates and trying to tell you when it's going to happen, just ignore them, run from them, because they do not know. And all of a sudden, we've heard so much. Remember 2000, the Y2K? Boy, everybody knew that just the strike of midnight, we were going out of here. We're still here. So all of a sudden, we have got numb to the effects of what we're to do. And when we talk about the coming of the Lord, it just kind of falls on deaf ears because we kind of like, you know, I've heard this all my life. Well, here, here's the thing you ought to know, that the disciples, way back 2,000 years ago, they thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Can I tell you, I, I really believe, I've read some theologians, and, and I really believe that the last day started on the day of Pentecost. And we got to understand that the, to the Lord, to the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. He's not in a hurry. But, but listen, not, not trying to put dates and times. Listen, if, if a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, We happen to be in the third day. He rose on the... Jonah come out of the belly of the well on the... Too many third day things happening. Can I tell you, I, I believe with all of my heart that you and I have an incredible opportunity seeing the coming of the Lord. And we better be ready. And we better not be sitting, but we better be doing something for the Lord. So let me, let me read to you in 2 Kings chapter 7, starting at verse 3, and it'll be up on the screen. And here, here, here's what it says. It says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? Boy, that is an incredible question. Why are we sitting here until we die? Why are we sitting here and letting Marion go to hell? Why are we sitting here and letting Williamson County slip into a, a dark eternity? Why are we sitting here and letting our family? Why? Verse 4. If we say we will enter the city, the famine in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we'll die also. Now, therefore... Come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we'll live. And if they kill us, we'll only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord, <laughs> for the Lord, come on, talk to me. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact. Their tents, their horses, their donkeys, they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went in to one tent they ate and they drank and they carried out silver and gold and clothing and they went and hid them then they came back and to the in, and entered another tent and carried some more from, from there also and went and hid it verse 9 then they said to one another we're not doing right <laughs> can I tell you we're not doing right we're not doing right this day is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Don't just sit there. Let's do something. 
I'm not talking to a person. I'm talking to a church. Let's not sit here any longer. How long will we sit and not do anything? I think those four lepers just kind of said it. Well, how long are we going to sit here until we die? I, I mean, how long? How, how long do we sit in a pew? How long do we stand on a platform? How long until we die? I think there's work that needs to be done. Let's pray. Father, God, we love you and thank you and praise you, God, for all of your blessings of life, God. We thank you. And God, I, I believe we are trying to stir our hearts, God, to become active people in the kingdom. And Father, I pray that today, I pray, God, start with me. God, I pray, help me not to be comfortable sitting and doing nothing. But God, help me to be active in your kingdom, God. Help me to, to take the light of the gospel, Lord, out into the dark highways and byways, God. Help me to share a testimony, God, of, of your saving grace, of your healing power, of your delivering power. God, help me, I pray. God, help me not to sit and die, but God, help me to go do something. God, I pray, help abundant life not to sit and die, but God, that we would do something for your kingdom. So God, I pray, anoint our ears and anoint this vessel of clay, please, one more time, Lord, just to speak your word, that your word would go forth, accomplish what it's sent to do, and God would give you praise for it. And everybody said amen. amen. Don't just sit there, do something. And they said to one another, can, can you see these four leprous men? They're sitting there and they're saying, why are we sitting here until we die? The, these four starving, fear-filled lepers led one of the greatest deliverances and bring revival that we read about in the book. And when I look at this, I begin to think these four fear-filled lepers, when they begin to make that journey toward the Syrian camp, I can only imagine, by them being so fearful, I can only imagine that they were walking softly. Because they, they thought the army was still there. And they were walking softly. I don't think I'm adding anything. Just help me a little bit. They were walking softly because they were fearful that the army down there would hear them. And they're walking softly down that path. <laughs> Wondering what are they going to find when they get there. And all of a sudden with those, with those feet hitting lightly on the ground. God... God began to do something, and all of a sudden, the Syrian army, instead of hearing feet of, of four men hitting the ground, they began to hear chariot wheels turning. They begin to hear swords clinging. They begin to hear trumpets blasting. And all of a sudden, they would come into their own thinking that, 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 that the king had, had hired the Egyptians and the Hittite army to come and attack them. And they were so fearful, they just jumped up and took off running and left everything intact. Four men walking softly. And God... Can I tell you, I, I, I can only imagine that that Syrian army, while they were sitting there, thinking that they had, had, had put a siege on Samaria, waiting to starve them out, that all of a sudden, instead of feeling like they were so all-powerful, all of a sudden when those four men begin to walk, and God began to change that walk in the chariot wheels turning and and, and, and swords clanging and trumpets blasting. All of a sudden, the, 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 the Syrian army that, that thought they were all of that in a bag of chips, all of a sudden, fear struck them. They got up and left and took uh, left everything that they owned and left it sitting there. All of a sudden, when they heard all of this noise, they were confused. Can I tell you, God's got a way. 
of confusing our enemy. So when you and I begin to understand what God is wanting to do in us. See the world, when the world looks at the church, here's what the world sees. They, they, they see weekend warriors with a low budget, untrained soldiers and, and criticized at every effort. They, they, they see a goal that is unreachable and unbelievable. But God... Somebody say, but God. Come on, but God. We serve a God who is a but God. He, he is a God who can take our feet and he can amplify that noise. He can amplify our voices when we begin to speak. And all of a sudden, the enemy doesn't hear us trying to sneak up on them. But what they hear is a host out of heaven beginning to, my God, they're going to come in and take over. God can correct our failures and, and confuse our enemies. But so many of us have come to the mentality that we just want to sit here and wait and see what God's doing. And <laughs> don't just sit there any longer. Let's do something for the kingdom. The lepers were sitting outside the walls of Samaria. Now, now you understand lepers. That, that was a disease that they would call you an outcast. So, so the people in the city of Samaria had thrown these four lepers out. You can't come in. You can't be around us. We don't want anything to do with you. In fact, if you study leprosy very much, what you see is this. It, it's a disease that's hard to look at. In fact, it's a disease that can be highly contagious if you get close. And all of a sudden, when I, I begin to look at this, I, I, I begin to, to wonder, here, here is Samaria, here is the Syrian army, and in between is the four lepers. Could it be, l let me just think out loud for a moment, could it be that the church has been supernaturally placed between the world and the enemy. He's placed us here not to sit and do nothing, but he's placed us here because we've got good news to share. We, we, we've got something to tell. Could it be that, that he has placed us supernaturally? Because see, the world, we're offensive to the world. They look at us and they're offended. They're offended by the way we live. They're offended by what we believe. They're offended. Their, 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 their humanistic tendencies and their materialistic wants. They're convicted when they see you and I. Because we're not living for the right now. We're living for the future. We're not living for the right. So all of a sudden, we become a thorn to them. And they know they know we have the potential to be highly contagious. Ah, oh, my God, somebody help me. We have the tendency to, to be highly contagious. We are in the world. We're just not of the world. Remember what Paul said? He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. And the Lord said, I am holy. You be holy also. So when I begin to look at this, I look at these four leopards. Why are we sitting here until we die? I look at the church as we have been strategically placed between the world and the enemy. Why are we sitting here until we die? Why is there no more personal evangelism? Why is there no more sharing your story? Why, why have we become so timid to tell the greatest news that planet Earth has ever received? Why? What happened? Because we have got so accustomed to just sitting and doing nothing. See, what you got to realize is we really got nothing to lose. <laughs> we got nothing to lose. The, the devil's going to fight us and the world doesn't want us. We've got nothing to lose. 
we, when you begin to look at this. So, so if we've got nothing to lose, why don't we just go ahead and do what we do? Why don't we preach and teach the Bible? Why don't we praise and worship like crazy children of God? Why don't we knock on doors and witness to the lost? Why don't we shout and why don't we dance and why don't... Boy, if you'd help me, this would preach a lot better right now. So, so all of a sudden, I, why don't we just go ahead and do what we have been sent here to do? We have not been sent here to sit on the side of a four-lane highway and have a beautiful building. We have been sent here as a hospital that is an emergency room to the lost and the dying to tell them the good news. Here's the problem. Has the devil stowed your joy? Has he stowed your victory? Has he stowed your miracle? Has he stowed your answer to prayer? Don't just sit there. Don't just sit there and let him steal. He's stealing our families. He's stealing our marriages. He's stealing our future. He's stealing our, 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 our destinies. So how long do we sit here? I, I, I've never seen a time, and listen, I, 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 I've been doing this a while, but I've never seen a time that the church has become so numb to the gospel. I, I, I've, I've never seen, and I believe it's very strategic. I believe that we have become numb because we haven't been busy. Can I tell you one of the worst things that can happen to the church is when we are idle. When we're idle. When we're idle, all we do is criticize everybody that's doing something because it makes us feel, God, I'm preaching good right now, because it makes us feel bad that they're doing something and we're not doing anything. So, 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 so what they do, they criticize us, so all of a sudden we get our feelings hurt because we're so thin-skinned. So we just sit here and do nothing? How long will we sit here and do nothing? Can I tell you, it's time to get up and do something. It's time to reclaim your joy. It's time to get back the answers of prayer. It's time to get your victory back. It's time to recover your miracle. It's time to reclaim the power in the Holy Ghost. It's time to get the anointing back in our life. Don't just sit there. Do something. But we suffer disappointment. We suffer, you know, the hurts and the pains. And all of a sudden, we're robbed. We're robbed of our worship. We're robbed of our faith. We're stripped of our destiny. We're blinded of our vision. We don't have a vision no more. We just want to come. And if we can have church and pay our bills, hoorah, hoorah. While the world dies and goes to a Christless eternity. What are we doing? What, 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 what has he stolen from you? I, are you going to hear this a lot through this? Don't just sit there. Do something. Boy, I, I, I'm going to tell you, this, this thing has got a hold of me. It seems like that we think that the enemy has got the noose around our neck and around our family's neck, and we're afraid to do anything about it. So all we do, we just kind of sit down and don't do anything. Let me tell you, we need to do something. We need to intercede for them. We need to fast and pray for them. We need to have faith in God. By, by all means, don't just sit there and watch something be destroyed. We've got to do something. If you can just imagine with me for a moment when those four lepers were walking down to see what they would find. Because they said this. I'm not talking. These were not faith-filled people. <laughs> Here's what they said. Listen, there's a famine in the city where we come from where they threw us out. If we went in there, they'll kill us. So let's, let's go to the camp of our enemy. And if, if they keep us alive, we'll live. And if they kill us, no big deal. We're going to die anyway. So, so they get up and they start making this journey. I, I, I don't know how far of a journey it was, but they, they begin to make the journey. And when they get there, coffee's still brewing. 
bacon still sizzling in the pan? Because they just dropped everything and ran. They, they didn't hear those number 10s, sandals, or chariots, and they heard armies, and they, they, they just run and they left everything. Then, then, when, then when they got there, when the four lepers got there, the Bible said they, they went into a tent because nobody was there. They went in, they ate, they got some money, they got some clothing. What did they do? They went and they hid it. Then they ran back to another tent. They got some more food. They got some more clothing. They got some more money. And the Bible said that they went and they hid it. <laughs> what are we hiding? What are we hiding from a world out there? Are, are, are we forgetting why we're here? Let, let, let me teach you just a little bit here. What and why? What and why? Th those are two words that hold life and death, blessing and cursing. What and why? What they received was incredible. Four lepers dying, starving to death. What they received was incredible. They went there, they got food, they got money, they got clothing. What? It was incredible what they got. Somebody say what. What they got. But why did they receive it? And see, here, here's where, where you and I have problems. We don't have problems with the what. We got problems with the whys. Why, why did they get money and food and clothing? Why? We know what they got. The Bible said what they got. So we know what it was. But the question is, why did they get it? Why did they get what they got? When well, Psalms 103, verse 7, it said this, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. To Israel, God revealed his acts. That's the what. Moses, to Moses, God revealed his ways. That's the why. See, I, I, I don't think that we have a problem understanding the what. We get the what. I think we got a problem understanding why. We know what we have. We have salvation. We have Holy Ghost baptism. We have anointing. We, we, we have the book that is truth. We have praise and we have work. We know what we've got. Here's the question. Why? Why have we got salvation? Why have we got Holy Ghost baptism with power to, to be a witness? Why? Why have we got health? Why have we been blessed financially? Why have we got peace that passes under? Why? See, we know the what. We know what we got. Why have we got it? Why? To, to hoard it up? To go bury it? Put, put it under something? Or, 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 or just to consume for ourselves, so we can get in a a, a huddle, if you will, and, and talk about how how good God is to us. See, see, we know what. I know that I got salvation because I called on the name of the Lord. I know I got that. But why? 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 Why did God save me? Why? Why? A lot of us are like the lepers. We found it, we ate it, we buried it, and we weared it. So, so I mean, we just kind of, what are we doing? We consume it. We wear it. We don't share it. We don't share it. I've got people in my family. That if the rapture took place right now, they would stay right here. They would stay on planet Earth. I, 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 I would be very safe in saying you've got family and friends that if the rapture took place, it's 1133. If the rapture took place at 1135 today, you've got friends and you've got family that would be left. Here's the question. Have you shared with them? Now, they know what you got. 
And a lot of them out there know why you got it. The world knows why you got it. The problem is we don't know why we got it. Why, why did God save us and redeem us? Why did God bless us? Why did God fill us with the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he said that we would be endued with power, that we would be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world? Why? See, we, we know the what. We know that. We, we just struggle with the why, why, why. Why, why are we here? I, I, I want you just to think about a, a, a few things. When's the last time you shared your story or the gospel story with somebody that was lost? When's the last time you did it? I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you haven't, and, and, and 94 or 96% of those born again Never do it in a lifetime. But can I tell you, if you ever win one person to the Lord, it's incredible. It's incredible. I, I, I can take you back, and I don't know how many months ago it's been now, over, over at Ricky's house. I, I, I can tell you what side that I was sitting on. I can tell you which hand I was holding. And to pray the prayer and him pray and and to him to say that he felt like God had forgiven him. When is the last time that we made it shareable? See, we know, we know what we got. We just don't know why we got it. We're hoarding it up. What, what happens if, if we leave Today, tomorrow, next week. What, what, what happens if we've hoarded up all of this stuff? Pastor Paul, what, what if we hoard up all the garments and all the food while the world is starving and running around naked and we've got it all here and we leave tomorrow? You, you ever wonder if God's going to say, hey, I didn't give you that to hoard it up and to hide it. I gave that to you to share it. I gave that to you for you to make it shareable. I, I, I see this all the time on Facebook. Somebody will say, you know, they'll put something on there and say, make it shareable. <laughs> make it shareable. We want to share that. Make it shareable. See, you, you on Facebook, some of you don't, don't do, but, but just on Facebook, there's certain things you can put as shareable and there's other things you can put as non-shareable. Christians, churches, we've almost said, hey, we've got the good news and we know what we got. We're just going to make it unshareable. We ain't going to share it with nobody. We're just going to keep this to ourselves. We know what we got. We're just not sure why we got it. So all of a sudden, when, when we begin to understand, God has given us something. L let me give you just a, a couple examples th throughout the Bible. Esther. We all know about Esther. Esther had some God-giving beauty. In fact, she was even elevated up to the position of of queen. But when she was elevated up to the position of queen, there was something that was happening. There was somebody that was trying to bring an extinction to the Jews. She wasn't there because of her beauty. She was there for a purpose. <laughs> but, but see, what happens is sometimes our God-given things tempt us from doing the why. She, 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 she could have stayed in her comfort zone. Hey, I'm the queen. I'm beautiful. I've got wardrobes. I've got servants. I've got... So, so, so her blessing... In, in fact, there, there was a book written some time ago that was titled this, Can You Stand to Be Blessed? Let me, let me just kind of stir your mind a little bit. You remember when the Pentecostal church was poor and broke and on the wrong side of the track? Some of you just kind of nod at me. You, you, you attended one of them churches. You, 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 you was looked down upon. You, you remember them services? 
You remember that old brown upright spinet piano that had about half of the ivory knocked off of the keys? And the person playing the piano, well, the person beating on the piano, I don't know if you really call it playing or not, but hey, they were beating on it. Do you remember how thankful we were that somebody knew where middle C was on that crazy thing? And, and, and they, they could start out amazing. And somebody would jump on their feet because all of a sudden they knew that grace that they had was amazing. And now, somehow, we've moved from that wrong side and that poor side of poverty. Now we're on the right side of the tracks. Now we've got, we've got you know, paved parking lots. We don't have to walk on the gravel. We, 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 we've got air conditioning. We don't have borrowed funeral fans. Come on. We, we, we don't have, we've we got to use a bathroom. We don't have a path that we go walking down. We, but can I tell you, people had joy unspeakable and full of glory, and they knew how to worship. They knew how to shout and dance. They knew when they come into the house of God, they had an expectation, I am coming to meet God. I am here for a time such as this. This is not a mistake. I am here for a reason, for a purpose. But somehow or another, when we shifted locations, we lost our purpose. We lost our why. And see, Esther could have. She could have forgot about the why. She could have looked at the what. What? I, I'm, the, I'm the queen. I, I'm beautiful. I've got, I've got everything. I've got servants to wait on me. More, more food than I can even eat. I, maybe, maybe we forgot who we are. Maybe we as a church have forgotten who we are. Can I tell you, I know it was a cliche, and I hated it went back years ago, but, but it's still true. We are king's kids. I, I, I know they, they use that, and I, I didn't like it when they use it, but can I tell you, it's still true. We are king's kids. We, have, we know that we have got rights and privileges. We know that we have authority over devils and sickness, and, and we, have, we have unlimited spiritual wealth. But we talked about Esther there. Listen to what Mordecai told her. Now, she knows she can die. If I go in there and the king doesn't accept me, I can die. Listen to what Mordecai says to her. Mordecai says this in Esther 4, 14. He says, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Listen, God loves Marion and Harrisburg and Carpendale and Murfreesboro and Benton and Harrisburg and, and all the surrounding areas way too much. And he's saying this to Abundant Life. Listen, Abundant Life, if you keep silent, I'll raise somebody else up. See, all of a sudden, I, I, I don't even know how God did it. I don't even really remember when God did it. But all of a sudden, we're not a local church anymore. We've become like a regional church. We got, we got people from, we got Pastor Paul, he, he drives all, all the way from, from Pinckneyville. Jay and Diana drive from Mitchellville. Mark and Rachel and them, they drive from Benton. The Evans drives from uh, Sessor. And, and we look at all of this, uh, that they're coming. Listen, it's not a local anymore. God has expanded our tents because I believe that God says, you're not going to be just the local church sitting here. I'm going to expand. God Almighty, I, I, I'm going to pull the tent pegs up, and I'm going to pull them out and stretch. I'm going to give you more territory than what you dreamed that I was going to give you. I'm going to stretch this thing out. But then we forgot why. So we can say we've got people from all over. We've got people that drive an hour one way to get here. Past several Assembly of God churches to get here. We know what we got, but we just don't know why we got it. We forgot who we are and why we're here. We, 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 we sit here in a nation right now that, that is cursed. I mean, our nation is cursed with all kind of diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. 
Sex has become a billion-dollar business in America. I think I, I, I just read that, 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 that porn has be, is a 12 billion with a B in America. 12 billion dollar business. We're, 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 we're dealing with violence and crime and and, and, and makes no sense. I, I mean, we live in Illinois and we hear about this in Chicago happening almost every weekend. People are being shot and people are being killed and people are being wounded. And I think a weekend or two weekends ago, there was 14 of 14 shots. Just a car drives up and just starts shooting. No, no apparent reason. They didn't have anything against them. They just started shooting. Three year old baby was shot. We sit here in the nation, and, and, and we, we, we know what we got. We're the richest nation in the world. But why? You remember when we used to send missionaries all over the world? I mean, America was like the number one missionary sending out. Now, we have missionaries coming here to tell us about Jesus because we have forgotten about Jesus. and We don't have nobody telling us about Jesus anymore. So we got missionaries coming here. So, so we know what we've got, but why do we have what we got? See, we don't know. Our witness has been hindered and hurt severely by the media. I mean, I mean, I mean look, not all of them. Thank God not all of them. But, but for, the, for, the, for a big part of, of your media, TV, radio preachers, what do they see and what do they hear? They hear a prosperity gospel. They, they, they see preachers with, with tailor-made suits and Rolex watches and driving up in limousines and living in, you know, 18,000 square foot houses and pleading with the widow to give them another $10. And we, we, heard, we know what we got, but we don't know why we got it. So we watch all of this. We do nothing about it. We just sit and let it go by. Can I tell you, if there's ever been a time not to sit and to do something, it's now. It's now. See, revival normally comes when when we pray and when we fast and when we trust God. But can I tell you, revival also comes down a different avenue at times. And it comes down an avenue of obedience to God. Let me just give you a couple examples. You remember Ezekiel? Remember when God took him and he took him to that great valley? (laughs) And he looked and it said there was... Many, many dry bones. And then it also said that they were very dry. And he asked Ezekiel a question. He said, can they live? Ezekiel had the right answer. He said, only you know, God. You know what God said? Prophesy to them. Prophesy to the wind. Prophesy that the wind will come down and put breath in them. Prophesy to them. And all of a sudden, there was a rattling going on down in that valley. Bones begin to come together. Muscles begin to develop. Sinew and ligaments and tendons. And all of a sudden, when they stood up, it was a mighty army down in that valley. Can I tell you, we need to start prophesying to our churches, to our families, to our leaders. We need to begin to prophesy and say, can these bones live? Absolutely, these bones can live. Can the youth group live? again? Yes, it can live again. Can the college and career live again? Yes, it can live again. But are we willing? Jonah. Just obedience. Didn't have a TV ministry. Didn't have a limousine. Well, he had a special ride, but it's not a ride I want to take. But he told him, he said, go there. Just out of obedience, go there. And you know the story, great revival happened in Nineveh. Just out of obedience. Just do what I tell you to do. Four lepers. They, 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 they didn't have no faith in God. They, they, they just were saying, well, if they let us live, we'll live. And if they kill us, we die. But God saw something. And God began to use it. But when they did what they did, he said, We're not doing right. You ever wonder what happened to them to make them think that? We're not doing right. I believe the Holy Ghost began to convict them. And can I tell you, I really believe the Holy Ghost is beginning to deal with me and convict me. We're just not doing right. Listen, we are incredibly blessed. Let me say it again. We are incredibly blessed. 
But, but it does us no good to hoard things up, to, to, to keep things, dig a hole and hide. It does us absolutely no good. Why don't we get doing something? Why don't we start inviting people to come to the house of God and, and, and go by, pick them up, take them out, take, whatever it takes, get them here. Push our hand. Let's build a building for the youth. Let's build a building, a, 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 an education wing. Let's build a fellowship. Hall. Let Push it. Let's, let's push it. Let, let, there's no need in doing it if we're not going to do anything just I just said. Maybe, 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 maybe the only thing we need to do is to get more padding on the pew. You know, we don't want you to have bed sores and just. Or do we just say, Pastor, I don't care if there's any padding on these pews or not. I'm going to wear this thing out when visitors come in. I'm going to share. Man, I look, I look across here and I think, man, there are some incredible testimonies. Incredible testimonies of what God has done in you, through you, with you. But are we, are we sharing it? If we don't do right, this is a day of good news. And if we remain silent, could judgment come on us? Well, I think so. I think so. I think so. I just don't want judgment to come on us. I... I, I Miss Reba, I, I don't want to go back to where we were 10 years ago. I, 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 I don't want to go back to 20 and 30 people sitting in here and singing on CD. I don't want to go back to that. God has blessed us. So, so what we got to do is to say this, God's blessed me for a reason. Now, I know what I got. I'm just trying to figure out why I've got it. I, I'm, I'm trying to share with you why you got it. <laughs> you got it to share. You didn't get it to hoard up. You didn't get it to put it in the bank. You got it to share. You, you remember 1 Samuel chapter 30? You remember David? D David David goes with his men and he's going to fight with the Philistines. And, and, and in verse 20 or chapter 29, they, they, they got looking and they said, wait a minute, I, I don't trust this guy. So they told him, they said, send him back home. Send him and his men back home. I remember what they used to say. They said Saul killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. What if he turns on us? Just send him on home. And the leader went and sent him home, and David went home, and he went back to Ziklag. And when he got back to Ziklag, what he found was this. Ziklag was burned down. All the families were gone. All their treasures was gone. So, so, so all of a sudden, he, he began to, to pray, and he said, God, do I go after them, or what do I do? do, I do? And God said, go after them, and you're going to overcome them. And David took his men, and they took off after him, and they got to a brook, and they got ready to cross over it, and only so many men could cross because they were so tired. But they were so frustrated. They wanted to stone David. They wanted to stone him, wanted to kill him. And the Bible said that David encouraged himself. In your King James, it said encouraged. And in and, and, and a lot of your other translations, it said he strengthened himself. I, I, I looked that up this morning. What, what, what did it mean? It, it meant to, to encourage. It meant to strengthen. It meant to prevail. It, you know, I, I, I've never been in this situation. I, I've been in some that's been close to this, but I've never been in quite this fully situation. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him to death. Can, can I tell you, that would be pretty discouraging. I really wouldn't want to preach to you if you had a bag of rocks and were getting ready to throw them. I really would, I, I would feel discouraged. That was what David felt. He felt discouraged. And, and all of a sudden, he encouraged himself. Now, now watch this story because I think we missed this part of it. There was a dying, starving slave that was the missing piece. They didn't know where the Amorites went to, but this one dying slave, he said, I'll tell you where they were. I'll tell you who did it. The missing piece. Could we be the missing piece in a world that has gone crazy? Could we be the missing piece? Play softly for me. See, for the world, without us, they will die in a desert of sin. But for us, without them, we will wander aimlessly. Won't know what our purpose is. But as long as there's a lost person out there, as long as there's a hurting person out there, 
I know what my why is. I know what I got. Now I know what my why is. My why is to tell them. I didn't understand going through what I went through three years ago. I didn't understand why I went through that. I thought I'd been pretty faithful to God. I didn't, I didn't get it. But I know what I got. Now I know why I went through what I went through to share with somebody. Not a secondhand story, but a firsthand story of a God who can bring healing. And a God who can even give a doctor that has lost the instruction of what he's supposed to do and not what he had intended to do. I, I know the why now. I know why. It's to share, not to consume it, not just to keep it here and we can share the story and everybody go, oh, yay, yay, yay. No, it's to tell those out there that don't know. Matt, you're not here just to set by Dana. You're not there just to hold that pew down. You're there. You went through what you went through, almost kissed death for a reason. Because there's others out there that need to know that even when you're that close, when your body's shutting down and, and they don't think you're going to make it, when a wife and a mama and a church begins to pray, God said, wait a minute. I'm hearing something coming down from that valley of dry bones. I'm hearing something. I'm going to move and I'm going to intervene. And all of a sudden, what looked like we were going to plan his funeral, now it's a story. So do we keep it in here? We share it out there. And we can go on. We can talk about each other, different things that we've gone through and why? Now you know why. You know what you got. You knew that before you got here. But you didn't know why. Now you know why. Now, we, we used it a little bit earlier in James. He said, don't be a hearer of the word only, but be a doer. Now the question is going to be this. You know what and you know why. The question will be, will you do the why? You're here to be a light. You're here to be salt and light to a lost and dying world. That's why we're here. Listen, you got to act right out there. You can't act right in here and act wrong out there. You got to act right in here and you got to act right out there. Without us, they'll die lost. But without them, we don't have any purpose. If everybody was born again, what would be our purpose? We have no purpose. We have no why. But because there's lost people out there. Do you want a miracle? Do something. Don't just sit there and hope for it. Do something. You want forgiveness? Do something. Don't just sit there and, and pray about it. Do something. We talk about revival. Don't just sit there. Let's do something that will cause revival. Let's do something. You want to be healed? Don't stay in your seat. Come down and let the, let the elders anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith over you. Don't just sit there. Do something. You want the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Do something. You want water baptized? Do something. Tell Miss Gala, tell me. We'll fill the tank up if it's one person. One person is important. Do something. We just sit and do nothing. world going to hell we sit guests come in and we sit who's that I don't think I've seen them before <laughs> get up off your backside and go over there we've got comfortable sitting Let's do something. 
Come here, Pastor John. Pastor Paul, come here. Sit right here. Sit right here. What would you think that if the leadership did this? I got a lost family. Guess they'll die lost. I don't know. I work with a lot of lost people, but, you know, just go to school with kids that are lost. And guess they'll just die lost. I don't know. Just what would happen if we said, why are we sitting here? Until we die. What if we said, let's get up? Where are we going? Well, the enemy's down here. And we're going to go to the enemy's camp. In fact, that'd be a good song for going to the enemy's